like the eternal city that is Rome. Hello, everyone. Today I'm joined by Matthew Allen Johnson. He is a longtime friend, a longtime guest on the show, actually. He was the first interview I ever did, say, last February. So that was 45 episodes ago. And really coming to the end of the year here, I want this to be one of the last episodes. There might be one or two more, but I think this is a good way to come back around. So, Matthew, how are you? today how have you been uh, i'm just recovering it's kind of funny i'm recovering from a fractured arm this arm right here fell down on my elbow fractured my arm kind of pertinent to our topic today but we'll see how that goes but i'm recovering two weeks out out from a fractured arm so yeah and so that topic redemptive suffering this mm -hmm. is when you wanted to talk about i think it's a very yeah. important topic just for a lot of people and so when you hear this topic, what first comes to mind? What do you think is most important about redemptive suffering? So with any kind of like thing, you got, you got the virtues and the gifts and the fruits. Let's take, for example, a background love. They say love is a choice. When you get married, love is a choice. Um, you can take the example of joy. Joy is a choice. Redemptive suffering, surprisingly enough, is a choice. On one hand, you can either choose to, you know, rejoice in your sufferings, as Colossians says, or you can wallow in it, be depressed, and not make anything of it. Not saying people who are depressed are not doing anything with their lives, but I'm saying choosing to be depressed rather than rejoicing in your sufferings like St. Paul did. So there's that too. That's one thing I would want people to know. Um, another thing would be, it may seem paradoxical, it may seem like a paradox, but there is comfort in finding joy in the suffering. So when we, like, for example, I broke, I, for all intents and purposes, I broke, fractured my arm. I chose to, you know, look on the positive. How could I apply these sufferings to help souls instead of sitting around, oh, what was me? My arm is hurting. I need to you know, take another pain pill. How can I, if I move my arm and it hurts, I can offer up that particular suffering for a soul. It may help them out and butterfly effect, you know, down the road. You never know. A ripple effect, if you will. Yeah, for sure. And that just reminds me of Jesus on the cross. So that's mm -hmm. really the ultimate act of suffering, but also the ultimate act of redemption for man. And so it was Jesus, his suffering that redeemed us. Jesus didn't need redeeming, but he redeemed us. So that's interesting there, being able to help other people by your suffering, very Christ-like. Yeah. And so, yeah, when people hear suffering, they automatically have that response of avoid this, stay away from this, suffering is bad. But just expanding, I guess, upon your previous answer what are some more ways that suffering can benefit the person how does that strengthen them as a christian well going back to what you said about um you know christ you know his his suffering is the ultimate suffering you know it says even saint thomas aquinas in the summa in the third part of the summa says he, he references first john 2 2 which says he is the proper pro i'm gonna say this word wrong mm -hmm. he is proprietation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So there's that. Um, but also, all the faithful are united in that suffering. So it's not that we're, you know, there's that passage that says what's lacking in the body of Christ. I, I can't remember the passage exactly. But um, there's kind yeah, of a strength in that. You, you know the one I'm talking about, right? The light of yeah, Paul says. vaguely. Vaguely. Um, let me see if I have it. I'll, I'll scroll as I'm saying it. But, um. It's like Christ is not lacking because Christ is the ultimate sacrificial lamb, but he wants us to mysteriously participate in the sufferings. So there's a strength in that. If we can participate in his sufferings, 
you know, it becomes qualitative rather than how many sufferings do I have or whatever. It becomes a kind of a quality way of suffering. You know, you, it, it puts value into your agony rather than, you know, before there was no value until Christ, you know, came and died for us. So you know, there's there's a type, that's one strength, it's the value. Um, another strength is it can get us through the day, you know. Like, everybody wants a solution to pain, you know. There's a solution, like, oh, I can have a pain patch, or I can have a pain pill, and that's good. That might be needed, because you might be in too intense of pain. But God will not give you any more than you can handle. So God's giving you what he knows you can handle, even though it may seem like you can't handle it, because he knows you can make it, you can help another soul. So Yeah. And I think um, I was thinking about Thomas Akippus, I believe. I was hearing somebody commentate just on him. And they were talking about how he said that people are not so much seeking what truly or what brings them pleasure in life. They're not. Um, that's not what gives them the happiness, that pleasure. But the pleasure or the happiness itself comes from avoiding pain or alleviating pain. So pain just, as a human, pain deeply affects us because we are body and soul. And so pain attacks our body and really forces our soul to comprehend it. And so it actually exists. It's very painful for us being in the flesh. And so I think the only way we can truly avoid pain or alleviate pain because you'll you'll never get rid of pain in this life even the buddhists they have that saying life is suffering because there's suffering everywhere mm -hmm. but pain can actually be alleviated through the soul through christianity by meditating upon heaven by keeping your eyes focused on heaven because if you think about the martyrs they were experiencing the worst pain being burned alive flayed their skin cut off but they had their sights on heaven, and so they were deeply happy, deeply happy. They were singing songs in the Colosseum and all of that. And so that was a long uh, talk there, but do any Christians come to mind who have suffered? Any saints that you think of when you think of suffering? St. Lawrence is a prime example, you know, but he, like we said, the choice of joy you know, he was being burned. Uh, what was it? Being burned alive. He said, turn me over. I'm done on this side. Um, there, <laughs> you have some saints that are, I'm thinking of the martyrs um, and red martyrdom because there's different types of martyrdom. You got St. Lawrence, St. Bartholomew. Um, you also have St. Catherine of Alexandria. She was put on the wheel and the wheel broke. So they did something else and that didn't happen. So they just beheaded her. And it just like, compilation of different like sufferings that she suffered one suffering didn't work that it would not end her life so they got frustrated so they did another suffering so god would use that to make it yeah. redemptive it just it just some of these saints it's not humorous and then like haha funny but it kind of makes you chuckle a bit it's like god has his way in the end over death and suffering it's kind of like intellectual humor it makes you yeah makes you like chuckle chuckle because you know that god wins in the end yeah, I think that's very important to keep in mind because the Bible says that if Christ, who is God, suffered the most, that we can't expect to be beyond suffering. So if you think mm -hmm. of all the saints, they all had their moments of deep suffering or the dark night of the soul, even for a couple saints like John mm -hmm. of the Cross or even somebody like Mother Teresa. They wrote a lot of mm -hmm. letters just about how they didn't. They weren't able to recognize God in their lives anymore. And so yeah. I think with Mother Teresa, the secular media got a hold of her journals after her death. And they were mm -hmm. saying that, oh, look at these scandalous journals that say Mother Teresa was having trouble having faith. And so that's something that Christians will always experience because it's like a mother weaning the child off the breast slowly yeah. and slowly. Like less and and then in life you get less 
of God's presence because you have those early consolations that you need to bring you uh, to recognize God at least. But then you need less and less to make sure you're not worshiping those consolations, but you're actually worshiping God. Yeah. So, yes. How does suffering bring us closer to God? Or finish um, you said what? Yeah, I thought you had a you look like you're about to say something else, but go, oh, I was go down either route you went. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening. Um yeah. Back to the dark. I was. I want, I want to touch on the dark night of the soul for a bit in yes. redemptive suffering. So that there's three stages. You know, the purgative way, the illuminative way, and the unitive way. That purgative way, we can say, is kind of an immature, you know, con, you know, immature way of like feeling consolation. You know, you're feeling them with your senses. You're feeling them with your soul, and God has to take them away in order for you to have the mature union with Him. You know, you can't really have a union with Him until all the things are stripped away. And so you can recognize him in your life rather than say, oh, I feel prayer. Therefore, that's God, you know. So you have that kind of a mature faith. It says in um, one place, when I walked as a child, I thought as a child. And then it says in another place, love is patient, love is kind. So God is patient and he's kind to us. But that doesn't mean God is nice. It says nowhere in the passages in the scriptures, God is nice. And we tend to think, oh, God is nice to us now. No saint or no, no other angel or any anybody is nice. Niceness is not a virtue. And I challenged one person, a friend of mine, to say, where in the Bible does it say Jesus and Mary were nice? He said, nowhere. And so yeah. they're not nice. It's um, it's actually kind of anti-charity to be that particular whatever. Kindness yeah. and gentleness is the thing, but to be whatever nice is not, it's not helping their suffering, you know, say, I'm yeah, going to so, alleviate your, yeah. So what's the difference between nice and kindness just for the audience? Charity. Niceness is lacking charity. Kindness has charity. This kindness is infused with the charity of God. Niceness is infused with your selfishness. So it's niceness has it. Explanation there. Niceness has your yeah. 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 And so you were saying something about the incarnation there before I interrupted you. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the um, the incarnation, if you know that that is a particular mystery in itself. That's one of the greatest mysteries, because you have some theologians saying that the incarnation would happen. You have some theologians saying, no, no, sorry. Let me backtrack. You have some theologians the Franciscan saying that incarnation would happen just because it was supposed to happen. The Dominican saying the incarna incarnation was needed because of sin. So there's kind of like a debate there between those two schools of thought. I'm personally on the thought of the incarnation happening because, because it's one of the greatest acts of God, this side of anything, for him to come down and stoop to our level and to become one of us, like so that we could become like him in the sense of theosis. Not like not in the sense that Mormons, you know, LDS think that oh, we'll become God Himself, you know. No, it's in the Catholic sense of theosis, via kenosis, you know, emptying ourselves so that God can fill Himself, fill ourselves with Him, and that's where redemptive suffering comes into play. Uh, we redemptive suffering is that kind of that kenosis for us that we participate in the kenosis of Christ, that we empty ourselves so that theosis can be made possible within us. By God's grace. Yeah, and St. Augustine said that all of our experiences in the world are supposed to really train our soul to recognize God. So through mm -hmm. all of our earthly experiences, they're supposed to bring us closer to God. St. Augustine actually said, I'm remembering it now, that if the physical world was useless, then God wouldn't have created it. But God created the physical world as it is to bring us closer to God. So that entire debate there between the Dominicans and Franciscans is very interesting. Because if you think about Adam in the garden, Eve in the garden, no suffering. But suffering comes later. And if you think about the parallel, I might be getting too deep into this topic here, but the parallel between the cross and the tree, the tree of knowledge in the garden. 
And so Adam and Eve, they couldn't eat of that tree yet because they were still innocent. They were still very young. They might have been hundreds of years old, but they didn't have much experience just with the physical world. Because in a way, suffering is one of the biggest teachers in life. Because if you think of a child, they put their hand on a stove. They never touch that stove again. But if you were just to tell them, don't touch the stove, they wouldn't do it. So in a way, I think that can be tied into just the suffering that we experience now. It's like God told Adam and Eve not to eat of this apple, not to eat of this fruit. So God tells us that as well, not to sin from the Bible, from the scriptures, from our parents. But once we actually sin, we experience that suffering just in the same way that a child putting his hand on the stove experiences. Mm -hmm. And then we really just come closer to God through that. And especially through Christ who suffered the most, we can combine our sufferings, share sufferings in a way. Yeah, exactly. And so I want to go back to that um, just for a second, go back to the tree analogy, the, the comparison between the tree of the garden and the tree of the cross. Yeah. It blew my in mind. The it's a good comparison because it deals a lot with suffering because in the tree of the garden, man wasn't willing to suffer in the tree of the, gar the tree of the cross. Man, God came down as man to suffer for us. That's one comparison. And so with the tree of the garden, also man kind himself took from the tree what he wasn't supposed to. And it's from the tree of the cross. God, the God man laid himself on the tree so that we would find redemption. There's a quote I wanted to read from St. John Paul II. It says, and this deals with this, all this topic. It was from Salvifici Dolores in 1984. In bringing about the redemption through suffering, Christ raised human suffering to the level of the redemption. Thus, each man in his sufferings can also become a sure in the redemptive suffering of Christ. And that's pretty much self-explanatory in itself. And St. Saint, Saint John Paul II knew suffering very well. Mm -hmm. You could see in, when he, he it kind of was a transfiguration in the way he, he looked, too. And physically, he suffering transformed him physically. You know, he was very, you know, sturdy, very athletic. But when he got shot and he, he got an assassination attempt, he started to kind of transform into like this weakened, to the world, he looked weak. You could tell that. Have you ever noticed that? Look, yeah, one picture of him. I'm a, little, I'm a little too young, but I've seen the videos of him on the balcony of St. Peter's. And he's just yeah. really, really old even. Yeah, he looks like he transformed into suffering. And it's like what was happening interiorly is happening is shown exteriorly. So that's, that's kind of a conforming to Christ, you know. You see in the Passion of the Christ, Christ is all, his one eye is blackened. You know, he's completely bloodied and beat up. And now on the exterior, what's happening in the interiorly, he kind of had that, he was going through that dark night. You know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, to not experience it for himself, but to share in our suffering that he knew we would suffer through later. Yeah. And so St. John Paul II, it's, it's interesting to bring him up because he really represents the suffering church at the moment, even through his mm -hmm. pontificate. He started out, there were a lot of vocations coming in, but by the end, not of his doing, of course, I think he actually improved vocations because they would have been a lot worse, but they went down a lot. Just the church in general, it has been under siege, under attack, just through the last decades. The last century, of course, it's really been a uniquely terrible century in the course of history, the 20th century I'm speaking of, that more people died from wars than I believe like the previous five centuries combined before yeah. the 20th century. So it's a crazy century, communism, atheism, paganism with the Nazis and all of that. So yeah, just like all of that. And in a way, it's like it's, it was even worse then last century than it was during the times of the Romans, the persecutions 2000 years ago. And so we're kind of as a church entering back into that. And I think John Paul II was an excellent leader just by example. Yeah. 
So you get to the third secret of Fatima and all of that, but I think just a general trend, we're going into dark times, so we better prepare ourselves for suffering. Yeah, they talk about the great chastisement, the great purification and all that. Well, that's to get us back. It's like kind of a dark night of the church, you know, it's to get us back into suffering. You know, it's we need it. We need that um, to learn how to be students of suffering in the school of suffering. Because if we're not going to, if we don't do that, we're going to become students of the world. And we'll, the school of the world is not, not forgiving at all. You take from the internet, you look on the internet. I mean, there's no forgiveness on the internet whatsoever. You say one thing, you're, you're lost forever. Whereas in the church, you know, you have this miraculous sacrament of confession, which for some people is a suffering because it's hard to confess your sins. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a very interesting dynamic there. The modern secular world versus the church. So you have Mm -hmm. the secular world pretty much just avoiding all pain. They don't see pain as valuable at all. Mm -hmm. It's, Be as comfortable as you can possibly be. Live as long as you can live. You see just those mad scientists, I think it's a good term, of people who are focused on immortality, trying to make humans immortal. They bring in all of this artificial intelligence, and they just reject that death and suffering are good things. And I say good things because Christ made them good. Death becomes a passage into the next life and suffering can be redemptive but they see them as evils mm-hmm. and so they are bad i'm not uh, a good theologian so i don't know if my usage of terms here is the correct usage but the secular world just rejects all of that and so they really lose out on just so many graces because all sufferings come from the father so if we accept everything is coming from god's will then it becomes beneficial for us and beneficial for others as you touched upon at the beginning of the show so yeah it's very very interesting there mm-hmm. just um i think we can talk about the uniformity with god's will we kind of yeah follow the example of Christ because the suffering Christ experienced on the cross was the ultimate example. It was the last thing he did. It was the most important thing of his earthly life. Not talking about the, well, it actually might be more important, but his ascension from the dead, that also comes after the suffering. So there is that hope there. But you also have the cross before that. So we all have to carry our cross. Mm Mm-hmm. Christ. And we all have crosses to carry, some more numerous than others. Some people may have 20, some people may have one large one. What what was it? Um, God appeared to St. Catherine of Siena. I think it was St. Catherine of Siena. And he said, you can pick any cross, give her a vision, all these crosses in this room. And she said, she looked and she said, I'll pick this one. And he's like, no, no, that's meant for married people because it was the heaviest cross. She wanted the heaviest cross that was meant for marriage. So that goes into marriage. Marriage is one of the heaviest crosses because you have to deal with the other person's stuff and you have to get them to heaven along with your family. Marriage is a hard sacrament to, and I can tell you, speak from personal experience, it's a hard but joyful sacrament to learn to deal with. It's worth it. Yeah. And so, in a way, we all have our different sufferings in life. It's like Mm -hmm. being loaded by the fire. And so, At the end of it all, hopefully, if we embrace those sufferings, we'll be a lot stronger at the Mm -hmm. end of it. So, yeah, St. Catherine of Siena, another quote from her is that she said to Jesus, it was like um, in her dialogues or whatnot, that while she was going through temptation, I don't think it was suffering, but just temptation, she was saying to Jesus, where are you at? Why did you leave me alone in these temptations? And so Jesus was saying to her that I was closest to you during those temptations. If I wasn't there, you would have been conquered by those temptations. You would have totally fallen. And so in a way, while we're suffering, while we're undergoing temptation, God is there ever more presently, 
ever more present. And so we just have to follow God's will, trusting in God, and live as if everything has meaning. I think mm -hmm. this would be a good way to wrap it up. Just everything have having meaning, meaning in today's world, in all of human existence. Things just, they don't happen randomly. That's what modern people believe, that everything happens randomly. That's what scientists believe. You have this random explosion that creates all of life. You have these random factors that lead to life. But Christians believe that God created us. God created the world to teach us, as St. Augustine said. And so suffering, God allows suffering to happen, to teach us. So it does have meaning. Any, any thoughts on that, suffering having meaning? Yeah, I think you touched on it right, right, pretty well. If suffering didn't have meaning, then what, then God God wouldn't have went through it for us. You know, God wanted to make it have meaning. It's kind, of, it's a paradox. A lot of this, these mysteries are kind of paradoxes to the world. You know, if suffering didn't have meaning, then why did God go through it for us? You know, that's that's my thought anyway. Yeah, that's that's an interesting note there as well. Just the paradoxes of Christianity. It all makes it it makes it more true in a way, because just think of the Buddhists. They say life is suffering. And so you're trying to eliminate that suffering and just experience nirvana or nothingness. That's what nirvana is. The Buddhist heaven, nothingness. And so modern people, they also believe that at death. They experience nothingness. And so that's what they aim toward. But even heaven or hell both have suffering involved. And so nothingness would be an insult to the human, to the human that has the capability to choose good and evil, the image of God being within them, the infiniteness that comes with that. So I'm referring to Father Sarah from Rose, an Orthodox father mm -hmm. who is talking about this, that people expire to nothingness nowadays, but that would be an insult. And so heaven and hell is a recognition of the specialness, the greatness of man being created uniquely in the image of God. Mm -hmm. And so, again, we have that power within us to choose good and evil to choose between suffering or to accept, to accept the better word, to accept suffering or to reject it. And all these things are bringing us closer to Christ. So any, any concluding thoughts just about this entire conversation? Um, I'd say it was a very good conversation. It we is. Good. We touched on a lot of different topics. I would say if you're going through any suffering, Remember that it is a choice and you do have a choice, but please, if you're going through any suffering, any kind of pain, any kind of agony, just look to the cross and look and remind yourself that Christ suffered what you're suffering in a different way, but he understands that he understands exactly what you're suffering and you're not alone. That's what a lot of people are tempted by the devil and the world and the flesh to think that they're alone in this suffering and this agony and this trial. Every trial, you you have Christ. Like you said with St. Catherine of Siena, every trial, you have God with you. Christ is with you. Emmanuel. That's the name name right there, Emmanuel. God is with us. And since we're in Advent right now, Emmanuel, God is with us, and God will be there with you in your suffering and trial. Yes, yeah, so this is a very good discussion to have during Advent, especially mm -hmm. because we remember the promise. So we remember God's promise. We trust in God. And that's the only way I think you can truly accept suffering. Because if you didn't believe in the promises of God, you would always try to reject suffering. You would always try to get rid of it, as you see people do. But with mm -hmm. God, you can truly accept that suffering because you know heaven is at the end of it. And so, yes, heaven is at the end of it all. And so... 
thank you for coming on and really sharing yeah. all of this insightful wisdom about this topic. Hopefully, I think it's um, we could really keep going just on some of the themes we were talking about because you can always just meditate more on suffering. It's not something that humans can fully understand. And so that'll be one of the questions we all have once we get to heaven. Why did you let us suffer, God? But even though we can't understand it, if you just think of a body, it experiences so much pain that it, it eventually it reaches a limit almost. The person like just loses consciousness or something. They go numb. They're not able to fully understand the power of suffering. But we just, again, trust in God. So that's what it all comes down to. Mm -hmm. So if people would like to keep up with you, with your work, I know you're working on a few books. So just tell us all about that, how the viewers can find you. So the main way for my, I'm going to start working on my YouTube channel again. So Catholics on record, you know, you see the bottom of the screen, it has the name there. Catholics on record. You can just look that up. It'll have a like a heart. It kind of, it kind of it's not copywriting, you're ripping off your symbol, uh, Michael, but it, it kind of looks, it's a heart. It, it, we kind of have the kind of like have brother symbols, the sacred heart. Um, it looks like the sacred heart. It's a, it's a fired. Um, but you can go to my blog, core923 at substack.com is where I'm posting a lot of my stuff for like interviews and stuff. So people can reference back to that and, and there's some other stuff that's coming up in the in the woodwork, you know, with the bo the books and stuff. I'm trying to get a book out on baptism and the different sacraments. So we're working hard here. Yes, working very hard. I do notice that just all of your different endeavors. And I think we're yeah. both really creative people, so we have lots of different endeavors, lots of different ideas. <laughs> but I think it's very um, useful, not only to other people. It's useful to us as well. It keeps us. Yeah going keeps us our fires lit and so it's always a pleasure to talk to you matthew and say again you thank you for your involvement with this podcast you've helped co-host in the past and all of that so you've been a long time friend of catholicism for the modern world we don't even have that name for the youtube channel anymore it's i am nowadays isidore cutis media the two patrons mm -hmm. of the internet so we'll continue to talk going forth and i am excited to see just what you create so all right best, you too. Of, best of wishes and may god bless you may god bless all the viewers not of the modern world for, for the, the modern, 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 modern world, world. that's, that's right there. And, and... fisher baron hello it's from the airport oh, yeah. hello oh, we're doing nice good to nice yeah. to meet you so who are you sir I'm Archbishop Joseph Nauman of the Archdiocese of Kansas City in Kansas. Yeah, do you want to bless this recorder? Is that is there a blessing for that? There's a blessing for everything. So, yeah, Lord, we ask you to bless this instrument and use it for good and for evangelism.